stream, that process is called erosion, and the actual dirt, silt, if you will, is called alluvion or alluvium. Okay? So these are terms just to be a little bit familiar with in that area. Another one of acquiring, we say, is through avulsion. Avulsion. Now that's a sudden movement of land, okay? And this is pretty difficult to visualize, so we use the little picture to give you an idea of what might occur here on avulsion. Let us say we have two large tracts of land. One is owned by A, one is owned by B, okay? And the dividing line, and it's been that way for a thousand years, has been the river, okay? So everything on this side is owned by A, everything this side is owned by B. Then one stormy night, first time in a thousand years, the river changes course, okay? Now, does that change the property line? No, no. Uh, that would be avulsion, a sudden removal, if you wish to think of it in that way, but this property is still owned by A, the other side is still owned by B. There's no division or change in the land under that type of thing, but that's what we'd call avulsion, okay? Now, there are a few other items listed there you can glance at, addition of fixtures where a tenant puts in fixtures perhaps and leaves them there at the end of the lease, then those transfer over to the landlord. And the last one be improvements made in air. You might glance at that to get a little understanding in that situation. Okay. Another way of acquiring, we say, is through occupancy. And in your notes, you'll notice there item one mentions abandonment. You can glance at that. Uh, item two mentions prescription. So we're going to hold off discussing that. We'll take a closer look at that at a later date, okay? The one that we want to talk about, and that's one called adverse possession. Adverse possession, okay? Now, this is acquisition of title to real property by continued possession against the will of the owner for five straight years, plus this outsider pays the property taxes on the property. It's based in the old thinking, or what we remember perhaps in the old movies, and that's the squatter's rights, okay? Where somebody comes on the land of another person, they live there or occupy it. They don't necessarily have to reside on the property, but they take that over and act like the owner, and eventually they may become the owner through what we call adverse possession. Now, don't get too upset about this thing. It happens uh, very, very seldom anymore in California, but we do want to be aware of the basis for this. Now, as we indicated, we have a situation where, let's say, A owns the property, okay? Now, it might be fenced or not, but it's a large tract of land, perhaps. Then we have the outsider over here, Party B. They come on the land. Now, they may live there, or maybe they just run their cattle on the property, uh, put in a crop, or whatever. But B comes on the property, acts like the owner, okay? Now, A probably spots them, sees them there, tells them to get off, but B stays on, okay? Now the thing is, if this outsider can hold on to that property, occupy, use it, hostile to the true owner, we say, for five straight years, and pay the property taxes on the property, then this person can claim ownership now by what we call adverse possession, okay? Now, first of all, let's talk about paying the property taxes. Uh, if I own a piece of property, I may pay the taxes. Can you pay them? Sure. Will the tax collector collect both checks? Sure. Will they tell you? No. Okay. No, they'll take both checks. So, uh, in a sense, this could happen. Now, the way the rule of the law reads is the one that pays the taxes first is the one that gets the credit for the payment of the taxes. Okay. But we want to be aware of the requirements now for adverse possession. And if you follow along in your notes, you'll find there we must have what we say open and notorious exclusive possession and actual occupation. So, so you don't have to reside on the property, but you have to actually occupy it. It must be hostile to the true owner's title. What does that mean? Basically, the owner hasn't given the party permission to be there. Now, what if they put up a fence or big no trespassing signs, okay? If the party adverse possessor doesn't bother tears down the fence, forgets the no trespassing sign, that's a good, good show of hostile use, okay? So one of the things to do would be to allow them on your property, and at least you stop that building up of the adverse possession for the five years. Also, you notice in paragraph number C, we say it must be under some claim of right or color of title. 
Now, claim of right merely means simple possession. They're on the property using it. All right, that's called a claim, a claim of right. Now, color of title, we say, is a defective instrument. Maybe our outsider has a deed to the property. They say, look at, I bought this from somebody for a dollar, okay? I have a title. No, that may be a forged deed, we don't know, but whatever. That is what they call color of title. They have some document to literally hang their hat on to say, I have an interest or an ownership in the property, okay? So you need one or the other. And then again, it must be continuous and uninterrupted for five straight years, and the last item is pay the property taxes before the owner pays them also. So we used to indicate that as a, it was a race to the tax collector's office to see who he could get down there first and make the payment. But if an adverse possessor can put all these together, then they say, I own the property through adverse possession, okay? Now, the owner's never going to buy that, okay? They're going to fight a tooth and nail. So probably to clear the title, as we say, you're going to have to go to court, and that court action will be called a quiet title action. Settle a fight and declare one or the other the true owner, okay? But that would be the court uh, case then called quiet title. And if the outsider can prove all those items, then they could become the new owner through adverse possession. Okay? So we don't see that too often in California. The third method, or the fifth me method in which we talk about transfer is rather general. But again, this would be through what we call acts of the parties between owners, a seller and a buyer, or through an act of law. Okay? Uh, item one would be what we call a private grant, and that is where one individual deeds or conveys title to another person. We'll talk about the various ways that can be accomplished. The other is called a public grant. Okay? Now, a public grant is where the government is giving property to an individual. The old homestead days, when you could move on property of the government and live there and improve it, and then the government would give you title. Okay? Now, the document, you'll notice that on item number two, the last word in that sentence two, the document is called a patent. A patent. We think of that as an invention, but it's also referring to the, the document where the government deeds property, conveys title to a private individual. Okay. Now, the other possibly way in which we can go is where a private individual gives the government some property, okay? And there's various ways that can be done, uh, what we call a public dedication. We're not concerned with the distinction there of a common law dedication versus a statutory dedication, but you might want to read those items over on the bottom of page 15, okay? Now, in looking at other ways of conveying title or transferring ownership, if you will. On the top of page 16, we mention operation of law or through court action. Quite a variety here, so kind of review these carefully and understand the distinctions between these various items. Number one, or item A, is the quiet title action. As we said, that's where somebody goes to court to settle a fight between disputing owners or supposed owners, and the court makes a decision one way or another, and that would be called a quiet title action. The second one is called a partition action. Partition, splitting it up. But what happens here is we have two owners, probably maybe two brothers, own property together, okay? Now, one brother wants to sell, and the other one doesn't. Or they want to split it, and they can't arrive at a decision on which half to give the other party. So they go to court. And the court splits it. Partition action, okay? Number C is your foreclosure. That will be in a loan foreclosure where the property is sold on behalf of the lender. We'll discuss that in the financing section. We also mention the execution sale, which we'll be discussing here shortly. Then we have a bankruptcy where a person uh, is uh, broke, so to speak, files a federal bankruptcy proceedings. Some of the property may be sold by the bankruptcy court. Another... A, Another example there of a transfer conveyance title, okay? And then number F, I want you to look at that one very carefully now. That's called SG, SG. And that's a situation where a person died, and again, remember, all the property of the deceased is gathered up in the court, and you start checking around, looking for heirs. Was there a will? You can't find anything. They look and look, advertising the paper for any living heirs of this person, blah, blah, blah. All right. That'll sit, that property and all the property of the estate will sit in the probate court. You know, probate court will take their fees and eat up the estate. But eventually, if no one shows up in five years, then the state of California will step in and say, we'll take it now, and that is by a cheat, okay? But that takes five years of waiting uh, in the probate court. But that's where a person has no will 
and no heirs, then it transfers to the state after five years by escheat. Okay? Another way of transferring, number G, is through eminent domain. Or keep in mind now, this is also referred many times as condemnation. Okay? But this is where the state, and when I mention the state, I mean the city, the county, airport authority, someone in that type of position, but they have a legal right to take private property, they have to pay just compensation for it, but it then is transferred to that particular entity. That's called eminent domain proceedings, or as we hear often, condemnation. They generally try to negotiate a purchase, but if they can't, it goes to court and the property is purchased from the individual. That's called eminent domain. Okay? Now, the last one uh, is called inverse condemnation. This is a situation where we'll say owners that reside around a, you know, a garbage dump, some type, or some area that they find has uh, been contaminated, uh, and it wasn't the owner's fault surrounding the properties. They can't live there any longer. They don't want the property, and of course the city doesn't want the properties either, but the private individuals take the city to court and make them buy their properties, condemn the properties, and that's referred to as inverse condemnation. We see this occasionally on airport situations where the airport expands and gets more uh, noisier as years go by and the owners can't stand it anymore, so they make the airport authority buy the surrounding property. The airport doesn't want it, need it, but they are forced in doing that through inverse condemnation. Now, the last item we look at is uh, transferring property with a deed. A deed, and that is the document, of course, by which title to real property is transferred from one party. We're going to call that party the grantor. Now, there's the OR rule again. The grantor is the owner, and it's transferred to the other party called the grantee. Okay, so the grantor is the one that's transferring. The receiver is the grantee. Also, in item number three, paragraph three at the bottom of page sixteen, we mention the word alienate to alienate the title means transfer ownership, transfer title, okay? So be very careful of that term. We're going to talk about in the financing lecture an alienation clause that is found in uh, loans, but the word alienate means we're bringing in a new owner, foreigner if you will, but to alienate title merely means to transfer title. Okay? Now on the bottom of page 16, we begin listing under paragraph A what we call the essentials to a valid deed. Now, there's very little in the course that I'm going to ask you to memorize specific items. In fact, if you try to memorize many of these things, you're going to drive yourself crazy, okay? You can't do it all. So most of it, get an understanding of the general terminology and a general knowledge of it, but don't try to list the five requirements for adverse possession or the requirements for a valid lease. You can't do it too well, okay? But this one area I would ask, try to remember what we call the essentials to a valid deed. It's very helpful to know what's required. It'll answer a lot of questions when you get into what is not required, okay? Or why would be a deed invalid? Would a deed be invalid? If it doesn't have the requirements, it's invalid, okay? So let's take a look then at the essentials to a valid deed. Number one, the deed must be in writing. Very obvious, okay? Number two, the parties must be properly described. Now, we don't need our full Christian name or anything of that nature or legal terminology, uh, your legal name, a name to identify a person by that name, okay? So parties must be properly described. And uh, number three, we must have a grantor that is competent. Now that's the grantor, that's the one that's conveying title. They must be competent, okay? Now that should raise some suspicions then. What about the grantee? Do they have to be competent? No, no. All we say on the grantee, must be capable of holding title. And as the notes indicate, they must be living. Okay, that's not a joke. Uh, in a sense, if you deeded property to a person that was deceased, the deed is invalid. Okay, so it must be competent. Now, a minor will find is, uh, is capable of holding title. They're not competent, but uh, they can hold title. So basically, it must be a living person. Okay. Number five, adequate description. I want you to be very careful. We're, later, we're going to talk about legal descriptions, and you don't need a legal description on a deed to make it valid, okay? Now, you can even get it recorded without a legal description. The one requirement is in title insurance. You must use legal descriptions. 
but an adequate description, enough there to identify the property. Then you need uh, operative words, and generally in the deed, on a grant deed, we'll use the word grant. I hereby grant to you this particular property, okay? And number seven, of course, must be signed by the grantor. Now, if I can't sign my name, I can use my X or cross, whatever you want to use, a mark, but it must be a witnessed mark, okay? And last, of course, we must deliver the deed, okay? And you must accept the deed. In other words, if I'm deeding it to you, uh, I must deliver the deed, and you must agree to take it. Now, yeah, I can't just pawn off property on you and tell you, hey, here's the deed, you know, and there's a big lawsuit pending. You've got to defend it, and you're the new owner. No, if you don't accept the property, of course, then it's not a valid transfer either. Okay. Now, when we talk about delivery, uh, what does that mean? I mean, do, physically you receive the deed? No, no. We say the deed has been delivered, okay, in one of two ways primarily we take delivery. And if you look in your notes now, in paragraph B1, we talk about delivery. The word alienation we talked about, and now we look at delivery, okay? A deed is presumed to have been delivered. First of all, if it's been recorded in the grantee's name, then it would appear that there has been a delivery made of the deed, okay? And keeping in mind you can't record it, until it's been acknowledged, notarized. So the grantor apparently was agreeable to that. But recording is presumption of delivery. Or if the grantee has possession of the deed, again, we presume the deed has been delivered. Okay? Now, what if a deed has been recorded? Okay? It, does that automatically mean, yes, there has been absolute delivery, you can't break it? No, no. Uh, in California, of course, we use escrow companies to handle a lot of the paperwork, and they are normally the ones who would pass it on to the title company who would record the deed. Now, if the deed was to be recorded prior to agreeing to all the terms, if they made an error and recorded early, the fact that it's recorded doesn't automatically mean there has been a proper delivery. So, uh, or maybe a deed has been made out to a grantee, and the grantee cops the deed early, okay, before they're supposed to have it. Well, the fact that they've got possession of the document doesn't prove delivery. It's presumption. If you have the deed in your possession, or if it's been recorded in your name, then we say it's presumed there has been proper delivery made of the deed, okay? So delivery can be done that way. And as I mentioned, uh, also the deed must be accepted by the grantee if somebody wants to pawn off property, deed property to you, and you don't want it, so you don't have to accept it. So normally, of course, we do, and acceptance is no problem. Now, if we remember the, non, uh, the essentials to a valid deed, it's much easier then to pick up all the other possible questions we can get on what is non-essential or why would a, a deed be invalid for any of the following reasons. So if you keep in mind what's required, then anything else is superfluous. They're trying to draw you off into an in correct answer. So if you look at the listing here, paragraph number uh, D, non-essentials, it does not have to be acknowledged. Now what is the acknowledgement? That's where the grantor went to the notary and said, this is my signature, and they stamped it notarized, all right? Now, does that make a deed valid or invalid? No. All it means is it's been notarized. And you don't need to acknowledge a deed or get it notarized to make it valid. Now, you can't record it without that, but you may have a deed in your possession without a notary or notarization on it and still a valid deed, okay? The other thing is you don't have to record the deed, okay? Now, you're foolish not to because nobody perhaps knows there has been a transfer of title. So we record to let everybody in the county know I'm the new owner, okay, to protect my interests. But if you don't record, it still doesn't make it an invalid deed, okay? And as we indicated, you do not have to have a competent grantee. Uh, it could be a minor, uh, an incompetent, some of that nature. Uh, they could be a valid transfer, even though to a mentally incompetent, okay? Any other items there, you can glance at also, okay? Now, working along in the same general area, under paragraph number E, we talk about a deed that is invalid. Well, again, keep in mind, if it doesn't have the essentials, then it's an invalid deed, okay? So we're just reiterating now why a deed would be void or invalid. And you can look through the list there. Number 
One, the grantor was a minor or incompetent. Number two, the grantee does not exist, okay? The name uh, given on the grantee's name was a fictitious person, okay? There was no one actually uh, exists under that name. And then following on uh, page 18, look through the rest of those items, uh, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Also, you notice following that is some information, again, relating to the acknowledgement. Now, we talked about that already, so we're not going to review that again, but the acknowledgement is going in front of a public official, generally a notary, and taking an oath, in effect, I swear this is my signature on this document, okay? And that is generally required for recording purposes. Now, in paragraph number G, we talk about recording. And as I said, that is filing the document with the county recorder's office. They actually take a photograph of it, and it's available then for anyone to see during business hours. So you can go down and check out uh, the files. Uh, it's some type of difficult trying to chase down the actual document. But the uh, recorder records all deeds, and they're listed under grantor and grantee. Okay. Now, the requirements to record, glance at those. We're not going to review that particular item, but you have to indicate, uh, of course, have an acknowledgment, indicate where to send the tax bills next to you, and a few other items there you can glance at, okay? Other thoughts regarding uh, recording, if you look in your notes now on page 18, item A, we indicate that the recording system was established to show sequential transfers of property, sequential transfers, and that is Item number C, what we call a chain of title, a chain of title, sequential transfers. If I presently own property, I have a deed recorded in my name, okay? Now, if I check back through the recorder's office, the person that sold me the property, the grantor under my deed, there would be a deed recorded showing them receiving title. And you can go right back through the whole history of all the past owners with the chain of title. Okay? Now, occasionally, a deed is not recorded, and there is a break in the title, and then the title companies have to straighten it out to make sure there has been a valid transfer right on through to the existing grantee. All right. Now, the last item we want to look at is regarding the types of deeds, and we're looking at the grant deed, the quit claim deed, the warranty deed, and a gift deed. Okay. Now, the grant deed is most often used in California. Okay. And the main benefit of the grant deed, we say, is that it carries two implied warranties. Now, what are warranties, all right? Those are guarantees, okay? But there are implied. In other words, there's nothing in the document that says this, but when I give you a grant deed as the grantee, I'm guaranteeing you two things. Basically, I own the property, I am the legal owner, and you're getting title, okay? And the other one is that there's no encumbrances. There's nothing wrong with the property that I haven't told you about, okay? Now, that doesn't mean the property is free and clear or there's no loans or debts or anything against the property. It just means that I've disclosed all of the problems to you, okay? So if I give you a grant deed and don't disclose, then that is uh, opening for a lawsuit because I've breached the, the warranties, okay? Now, the other type of deed we find quite often used, that's the quit claim deed. And uh, in that case, the grantor, not a quitter, we call it a grantor, merely says, I am relinquishing all rights I have in the property, okay? Now, if I want to sell you uh, a couple hundred yards of the Pacific Ocean uh, off Southern California, and I'll give you a bargain rate, and I'll give you a quit claim deed, and you're willing to go along with that, uh, in a sense, I'm giving you whatever interest I have, which is nothing. So we have to be a little careful in using quit claim deeds the problem is it, it carries no warranties. Now, that does not make the quit claim deed a fraudulent uh, or uh, illegal document. It's used constantly to clear off uh, matters of record, uh, color of title problems, and it could be good, valid transfer of title using a quit claim deed. So there's nothing wrong in using it, but if you don't have a grant deed, you're not getting the warranties that you would have. Okay? The third one is the warranty deed. Now, these are used in other states, and all they do is they type in the two guarantees, in effect. The two warranties are spelled out in the actual document. Uh, we don't bother with that. We have title insurance in California to back up our uh, titles, so we don't use the warranty deed to that effect. 
The fourth one is the gift deed. When anyone is giving property to another, uh, that deed would be called a gift deed. Now, you could use a grant deed or a quit claim deed, but the fact that there is no consideration paid uh, at the time, it's just we say love and affection is the consideration, uh, that would be considered a gift at the time, a gift deed. So these are the various four types of deeds. And with that, we conclude our chapter number two on ownership and transfers of property.